Thank you all for joining this important conversation today. We're discussing driving continuous career development. I want to start by asking each of you to sort of define what continuous career development even means to you and done well, what does it look like? It's a great question. I think it's uh, one of the most powerful statements I've, I've heard. And, and for me, I also associate to a growth mindset um, where you've got the willingness to take on more skills, continuously improve, lift your competencies and knowledge. What's more important that sits beneath that is the ability for the organisation to embrace that as well. For me, it's about joining an organisation where it's not just about joining for a job. It's an opportunity to join an organisation where you're going to have multiple careers within that company. Mm. So I use a phrase that we say from high to hired to retired. And if as an organisation you can create this wonderful talent marketplace where people have the opportunity to not only consider their career aspirations or multiple career aspirations, but then you've got leaders that are able to see these showcase skills, that's utopia. I think there's a twofold approach, and that is as an employee being committed to constantly reskilling and upskilling so that you stay ahead of the future. And as an organization, it's being committed to the future viability of your employees and the sustainability of their careers. There was a recent survey done by PwC Global, which found that more than 70% of CEOs around the world are quite concerned about a lack of skills across their organization. How do you identify those skills gaps to begin with? I think the key area to focus on is to really take a look at the current level of skills of employees and mapping that to future organizational priorities and identifying gaps there. To Jenna's point, having a talent marketplace really facilitates and enables that in ways that um, were unimaginable in the past. And so we have the capabilities, we have the technology now to be able to really center and focus employees in the right direction. Hmm. And I think leading on to Terry's point, there's also an opportunity to have a look at that internal audience and to actually decipher or decode their current equation for success versus what they want to do in the future. So being able to look at your existing workforce and their current capability versus where you see that business going and then using that to determine your future roadmap. How can we increase Mark's skill set to be able to achieve his aspirations and then the needs of our business versus our external hiring strategy and individuals that we can bring in to be able to bridge the gap if there is a gap. What role does technology play in this process in terms of identifying skill gaps and then of course creating those learning and development programs to fill those gaps? Depends on which um, direction you're coming from. So if you're looking internally and you're looking specifically at job families, you can use technology to take your existing job description um, and what the team does and you can use smart technology to then be able to decipher the skills, both the real and the power skills and then the more technical hard skills to determine that equation for success that you need in that particular role. But flip it on the other side from a talent acquisition and then how you onboard people, it's also about being able to use the technology to be able to harness their potential. Dr. Turd, this is an area you're, where you specialize. How do you advise companies and HR functions to really harness the power of technology? I think when we really look at generative AI, we know it has the propensity to increase productivity by at least 14% at this point. But when we really funnel that down and take a look at how it can help organizations identify skills, you can use generative AI to assess skills. You can use generative AI to create personalized and adaptive learning um, that is able to capture that data and empower organizations to be able to take a deeper dive into where they have those gaps and to really create some dynamic actions around them. Hmm. How are you finding the newest, youngest generation of the workforce to be different or similar in their kind of appetite for and approach to learning and development? I think they're growing up in a world where technology is different. Um, they consume media anytime they want, anywhere. And, and we have to reflect that in our learning offer. I think how we build and think about experiences to build careers and build skills, we have to build a framework where it's available anytime, anywhere, and just for me. So that real tailored, curated experience, I think that is how it's gonna evolve. But we also shouldn't underestimate you know, the older generation and, and they're just as adaptable um, in terms of change and how they stay competitive in the market as well. Mm. 
And if we take a step back um, and look at learning and development programs or strategies, how do you tie L&D to the business impact? Uh, I think if you can listen to your team, if you can listen to the voice of your team, and they can tell you that I feel very engaged, I feel I have an opportunity to learn new skills, to grow my career, that would be, for me, the most important and critical um, result you can actually measure. Mm. Retention is really important from the perspective of a highly engaged workforce, and that's evident through, through many organisations where they're investing in, and it's very visual, the investment, in terms of what's learning. It's led, it's led by executives, it's led by leaders, it's led by a team. Mark has hit the nail on the head. I completely agree, you know, having a look at your employee engagement scores, having a look at minimalizing attrition. But that EVP, that employee value proposition, has such a power that can be harnessed to then take it out into the external market where you start looking at employer brand. Mm -hmm. Does this bring talent acquisition teams and L&D teams closer together? Organizations are, uh, are struggling with the pain of talent scarcity externally, right? So if you bring together your talent acquisition teams with your learning and development teams and your talent management teams, then you are eradicating talent scarcity internally. That then has a knock-on to your employee value proposition, which has a knock-on onto your employer brand, which means that externally, talent and organizations where that investment is not happening, mm. start paying attention to you as an organization, which means nothing but positivity about the talent that you're bringing in, because you're demonstrating through internal mobility and investing into your people, the instrumental success of your business, that you are 100% in all the time. Dr. Terry, how do you advise companies on the, on the internal communication of the learning and development culture? Yeah, developing a culture of continuous learning is a challenge, um, and part of that challenge is helping employees to understand that the organization is completely committed to it. It is consistently delivering communication and outcomes and successes around learning. I think there's also a genuine magical moment when you share success whether it be a promotion or whether it be a lateral move and using that as a meaningful moment to go, look what Devin did. This is great because, you know, it takes one person to put their hand up and have the courage and then there's two people, then there's 20 people, then there's 200. And before you know it, you're capitalizing on the true power of a talent marketplace. And it's not a once-off event. It's, no. it's continuous. It's, it's the ability to demonstrate the fact that, you know, careers can be built and, and careers are defined differently for many people and the multiple generations we talk about, whether it's if it's in one role, whether it continues to develop and, and build their skills over time, that's, that's personalized, it's for them, it's meaningful. This concept of an internal talent marketplace is so interesting. Should more companies, uh, Jenna, look internally first for new roles? If you're well aware that the skill set is within the business, 100% you should be looking internally. And some organizations go as far as to mandate that we will only look internally for the first seven days, 14 right. days of an opportunity be, being created. But there will be situations where the talent or the skill is not in the organization yet. I think that's a balance between you know, uh, developing, uh, buying talent, developing talent within, and, and obviously then the opportunity to mobilize your internal talent. I think that's a real critical art for an organization to understand when to over-index on either. And it really does come back to understanding where your capability gaps are your organization at that point in time. The talent market, the labor market remains fairly tight and competitive. How does that message get across externally to job candidates? How do they learn about L&D success stories from the outside? I think being able to promote your EVP externally is incredibly important, but I think there's also an opportunity to harness the power of word of mouth. So I'm not talking about someone who successfully has gained employment in your organization. I'm talking about the people who didn't. But making sure that those individuals that didn't actually get the job in your organization had a first class experience regardless. Showcase how great your organization is and how you invest in your L&D and the full talent ecosystem within your organization. But that original candidate that got rejected, they'll come back in six months and they'll try again. There's an opportunity as well to really borrow synergies, L&D to borrow synergies from marketing 
what's at stake is the employer brand and the employer reputation. And L&D is really kind of driving the trajectory, if you really think yep. about that. Mm -hmm. And so being able to tell that story in compelling ways that resonate at every touch point becomes just as critically uh, important as managing from the consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. Are there some ways for our viewers who perhaps may be experiencing a tighter budget or constrained resources to continue pushing the envelope on, on L&D? I would say one of the key opportunities, absolutely hands down, is to leverage Gen AI. You can leverage Gen AI to create learning programs like that, hmm. um, that are responsive and that really mitigate a lot of issues tied to cost. Whether it is putting in place an adaptive learning or personalized learning um, for employees that are now faced with working from home, or there's training that needs to be um, administered in the, uh, right away. I think leveraging Gen AI is a way to help that. So what does the future of learning and development look like? If we were to reconvene in three years or five years, what uh, would we be talking about, do you think? The future um, that I see uh, is that organizations will continue to make significant investments in generative AI. There are, I think to date, if my memory serves me correctly, um, four or 5,000 tools, Gen AI tools that have already launched since the top of the year, <laughs> whether it's Gen AI to text or audio or 3D printing or to video, and that momentum will continue. I think there's an opportunity for talent leaders in this day and age to actually come together outside of their own organizations and actually share learning experiences. So although you've not paid me to say this, I am going to say that being able to leverage environments like Talent Connect means that you're in a situation that you're able to learn from each other. And I think that is absolutely invaluable. One more thought to the process is around um, not underestimating the value of technology and the influence it's having up front in the process and how some of those recruitment and talent acquisition tools and resources and new technology that's coming, how it's going to inform the learning agenda, how it's going to inform skills for the future. I think that's really important to understand. Dr. Terry, you have such an interesting vantage point across HR functions, organizations, companies. Are there any examples who are doing upskilling very well? There are a few really recent compelling examples um, that are wonderful. I'll start with Walmart. Walmart launched a Gen AI playground for employees to begin experimenting and learning about generative AI. It was a great way to inspire curiosity um, and also mitigate fears that employees might have about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence. The second example is PwC. PwC committed to upskilling all of their employees in generative AI. And if I can quote the chief people officer, she said that the reason for that was that all employees needed to learn um, generative AI. And then the last example is for Reuters. Reuters conducted an enterprise-wide learning day where, where 15,000 uh, colleagues came together for an immersive experience to learn Gen AI. And the quote was that they wanted all employees to be AI-powered and empowered. Conversations like this and forums like this allow all of us and all of our viewers to uh, learn from each other and develop themselves. So I want to thank the three of you for this fascinating, productive conversation today. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Pleasure.